You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anatoby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. Our third sponsor is Diffie Ford Lincoln down in El Reno. Now, this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine, um, play a lot of golf together. I've bought my cars from them. Do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, DiffieFord.net, and then on Instagram at DiffieFordLincoln. This episode is presented by Citizens Bank of Edmond. Citizens Bank of Edmond has been serving Edmond since 1901. They pride themselves on investing in the community and are here for all your personal and business banking needs. For more information, go to MyCitizens.Bank and follow them on Instagram at Citizens Edmund, as well as Go bank there because I bank there too. It's been a fantastic personal experience for me. I've had my podcast account there now, my podcast business account there now for a few, four years now, I think. And it's been fantastic. So definitely worth your time. They're a great group of people and they're always there to answer the phone when I forget my password because I seem to forget it daily. Um, So yeah, go to Citizens Edmund and um, check them out. It's been awesome. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike and here, host, back with another episode. Got a fantastic episode for you today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to the podcast Julie Stewart of Kiss and Punch. And Kiss and Punch is not a gym or anything to do with martial arts. Martial arts. <laughs> uh, look it up on Instagram. The Instagram will be down below in the description. Uh, it's illustration, drawing animals, and really cool stuff. And we're going to get into it, which uh, get into why Julie decided to to leave, I guess, the corporate world of being a lawyer and get into drawing really cool stuff and using social media to do that. So, Julie, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to dive in. I found your Instagram and and started looking at, like, obviously the cards that you do and all the illustration stuff and... um, Obviously, you have a you know a skill for drawing and an eye for um, design and detail, but you were a lawyer before that, and you were like a really corporate lawyer, which is total opposite worlds, right? <laughs> a really corporate lawyer, yes. Yeah. This is true. So before we dive into, I guess, the corporate stuff, let's set a little bit of context. Tell me a little bit about you. Um, I am originally from Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay. Um, that'll kind of lead into why I chose Oklahoma, but... Um, uh, my, I'm half Vietnamese and half Scottish American. Um, uh, I, have always loved to learn, was a smart aleck as a kid, as my mother would probably tell you. Um, loved art as a kid in Utah. So okay. growing up in Utah, loved my childhood, um, Looking back now, I feel like art class there was not the same as other places. Mm -hmm. This was like a, you know, let's go out and pick a maple leaf off the ground and you're going to make a trinket dish. You're going to stamp it into clay and make a dish out of it. Or, you know, we're going to make a um, animal pillow and you're going to draw a face on it and you're going to sew it together and wood shop and things like that, like way advanced compared to the things that I see my son do or son when he, when he was in school. So um, uh, that has a lot to do with, I think, uh, my love for art. I, it was always part of my life, but um, 
didn't know growing up that that was something you could do as a career. Mm -hmm. Um, In high school, I was involved in student government and I was the one that drew all the big signs for the football games and assemblies and uh, designed shirts and flyers. But no one told me that that was something that I could do as a career. So um, I never pursued it. Um, When I was 10 years old, uh, my dad had passed away. And shortly after that, my uncle had asked me, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I didn't have an answer. I said, I, I don't know. And he said, you're smart. You like to write. You should be a corporate lawyer. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> and he's like, you know, you don't go to court. You don't do any of that stuff, but you do, you know, you do all the big deals and you, you know, you make all these big deals and things happen like they happen because of uh, the corporate lawyers. And I think that he was had an accounting background. So that's why he said that. But I took that and I tucked it away. And whenever someone after that asked me as a little kid what I wanted to be when I grew up, I actually said, I'm going to be a corporate lawyer. Um, I really didn't have any idea what that meant until obviously a lot later in my life. So, um, yeah, that just kind of happened by default very strange, but um, I, al- I always blame him for <laughs> getting me into this in the first place. It's your place. fault, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. So always, always grew up with a lover of art. And I think like as a kid, right, we just, we just love to draw, right? Most people, right. I mean, I did too. Um, but also, yeah, it wasn't something that I thought I could have a career in. Some of my friends who were very good at it, you know, kind of went into graphic design, but that was a lot later on in school. Whereas, like, when you're a kid and you're, you know, you're, you know, eight, nine, ten, whatever, you figure out how to draw a house, or, you know, you figure out how to draw, most guys draw a car, you know, and have the, the kind of get after it and color it and stuff like that. But yeah, you're right. Like, there was no, you know, hey, you can create and there's the, you know, you can now draw on an iPad, right? And have all this yes. stuff. And it's, and, the amount of technology and the ability to create something now is obviously a lot easier than just like having a piece of pen, a pen, a piece of paper and a pencil. Right. right? And those like, you know, those, those massive pack of like, if you had that, what did that giant pack of Crayola color pencils, right? Like you were like, that was like the great, you know, that was the greatest pack ever. Right. Super pack. (laughs) The super pack. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm glad it's great. I can't wait to kind of dive into the story. And it's a full circle moment for you, obviously, to have this business and go back to that. Um, right. But yeah, as a ten year old, and your uncle's like, "You should have gone corporate lawyer." <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So from that moment, then you kind of go through school, you know, middle school, high school, and you, and you're just you're like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do that." I don't know what that looks like, but eventually, I guess you figure out what that looks like, and you decide to. Well, I guess when was the moment that you think that, oh, I know what this is now. Yeah, I'm going to go do that. The corporate law? Yeah. Um, well, uh, in high school, like I said, no one told me, even though I was technically doing graphic design, no one told me that that was something I could do. Um, I did enjoy school newspapers, so I decided let's major in broadcast journalism. Mm-hmm. So I did that. I went to USC. I ended up double majoring in political science, thought I was going to be a political reporter, worked in uh, TV news the whole time I was in school. I even did a stint in George, at, at Georgetown in the summer, one of the summers, and worked at Meet the Press, which I thought, ooh, this is a big deal. Um, but by my junior year, I just felt like this isn't intellectually stimulating for me. This is not something I want to keep doing. It just felt really um, empty. Um, so corporate law. <laughs> a lot of my friends who were in on the political science side were planning to go to law school. Mm. So I kind of, you know, um, changed gears and started focusing on that. I took a year off, was a paralegal for a year at a real estate firm, actually, and did, uh, I, I focused mostly on the corporate law part of it. So forming the companies for big deals. Um, we worked on one big deal that was supposed to be the uh, DreamWorks studio um, spot in Los Angeles, it, it fell through, but we worked on the deal the whole time I was there. I got into the other school on the other side of LA, UCLA, and uh, ended up going there. And surprisingly, once I got to law school, lots of hours of reading case law all the time, and um, any break that I had, 
I found myself turning back to art, which was strange. Mm -hmm. I would paint and do abstract paints and, you know, my friends, my classmates said that uh, in law school the whole time I would doodle little things all the time. My favorite thing to do was to pick an animal that I thought our professor looked the most like and then draw it in class. And so I was always doing that and just kind of unconsciously doing that. Just, it was just my thing. Yeah. And then any free time I had, um, I even made this mosaic table. Like it took me two years in law school to do it, but it was just something I needed to use the right side of my brain. Using my left side was just too much and too overwhelming. So um, a lot of that came out in law school and it was really strange, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. It's just like, oh, this is what I do mm -hmm. to relax is to do art um, and didn't think much of it. Um, fast forward to when I become a lawyer, um, still doing things like that and just not, you know, being in these really big meetings. I mean, I'm, I'm the lowest of the totem pole, but I'm in the meetings and like, I'm supposed to be taking notes, but like when it gets to the boring parts where they're just, you know, fighting and stuff, I'm just like doodling. And I'm sure my, the partners that I worked with were just like, why is she doing that? You know, I just, I just did that. I don't know. It just, it came naturally. Um, until one day, I was at a, my firm, and um, I would say most of my, all, all of my bosses that were lawyers were horrible, every single one of them. This one in particular was very childish, and he liked to fight like we were in fourth grade, so we had it out, and I was like, I got to take a walk, and I, you know, picked up my stuff, and I, the law firm was in Westwood Village, so I'm still by UCLA. And I walk out, there's you know a bunch of restaurants and stuff, um, and I stumble upon a stationery store. This stationery store is the store that whenever we did a big deal and we closed, the same partner would take us there, buy us a fancy $400 pen, which I could care less about, because you can't draw with it. It's like really like, so when you're trying to sign something, that's the kind of pen you, you yeah, pull out. But it's like, not the one to draw, yeah, it's total just, opposite. You know. yeah. And I didn't realize they had um, a card section in the back. So I'm wandering around, I end up in the store, um, wanders the back, and I just start looking at the cards. And I'm like laughing. I mean, at this point I'm doing like, um, kind of like scrapbooking type greeting cards just for family and close family and friends. I do like 10 a year at that point, like nothing big, nothing crazy. But uh, I was gone for two hours. And I remember, you know, finally turning my phone back on and people were just like, where are you? Like, we've been looking for you. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just down the street. I'll be right back. And I found myself after that going back every time I was stressed out. So I feel like the art came with stress. Like that was my relief, made me feel better. And um, one day I'm in the store and I'm looking at this card and I'm like, it's letterpress card. And I'm like, I can do this. I could totally do this. Like I do this all the time. Just, I don't know how the printing process works. So right then and there, I um, went back to the office and looked up um, letterpress printing and learning uh, how, to, how to learn. And I signed up for classes at, in San Francisco, of all places, but I didn't have to go that far. But I signed up for classes at the San Francisco Center for the Book. And I started flying up on weekends to learn everything I could about letterpress printing, and um, I just, I did that for like a year. Yeah. Started signing up for um, art, just like graphic design classes at Otis um, College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. So I was, I was learning again, you know, doing all of this on the side while maintaining a full-time corporate job. Um, I mean, I did entertainment law at that firm, so that was really crazy. And you know, you had big client. We had big clients like Marvel and uh, Upper Deck and um, things like that. So I, I basically didn't sleep. I just was doing <laughs> this all the time. Right. Um, and then decided, you know, maybe I should not do the law firm life and billable hours life, and let's go in house. So then I go in house at Honda, which isn't close. I have to commute there, but I, I thought that 
I mistakenly thought that would be a cush job and ended up not being a cush job. Uh, I probably worked more there because uh, there the law department was kind of weird. Like I was a corporate person, so I did contracts. That's what a corporate lawyer does. It's just contracts. And all the litigators there, um, they use outside law firms, so they didn't really do much. They just would sit back and like relax and let them do everything and just review it. Me, little me, I'm the only corporate person. I'm doing uh, all the corporate structure stuff. I'm doing contracts for all of the, you know, purchasing department. And Honda's a huge company, yeah. so um, it was uh, a lot of work. But um, at that, by that point, Kiss and Punch had already started. So um, I was, I probably did both for five years. Wow. And that got to be pretty exhausting. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's successfully now a true, you know, it goes from like a true side hustle to what you do full time, right? right. Which is kind of like, right. quote, the American dream, you know, whatever it is you want to call it. Like, you know, most people and hopefully people listening to this and if you've, they, they've listened to this or if anyone's listened to this for an extended period of time, there's many stories of that. And I love that. Like it's, you know, this is Oklahoma is, is, is a version of that too. You know, it's like you find something, you know, you go down a career path and you you know, do it, the corporate thing or whatever it is, because society tells you you need to do something and get a job and have a W-2 and a salary and <laughs> have a house with a picket fence and, you know, two and a half kids and a dog. Right. And, you know, you kind of go down that road and then you look, you know, one day you might look at yourself in the mirror and be like, actually, I remember what I used to do as a kid and I want to do that. I love right. doing it. And now I'm allowed, now there is a platform to do that. Right. right. And then it becomes, you know, it slowly goes from a passion to a business. And then like I said, you get to a point where you're like, you know what? I don't want to go to work every day. I want to do this, uh, right. which I can't wait to dive into that too. Backing up a little bit though, why did you choose to go to California to go to USC from Utah? Oh, sorry. I should back up. Um, I was in Utah until eighth grade. Okay. And then I moved, moved to, Cal to California. Okay. That was the hardest year of my life because, uh, you know, like I said, my You're childhood like, in Utah was great. Yeah. I wasn't Mormon, but I always felt included. Mm -hmm. um, I always felt welcome. Everyone was friendly. I had tons of friends. And then I moved to California and everyone was just so different. And, you know, like I said, I'm half Vietnamese and, and half Scottish American. Everyone was just like, what are you? What are you? Those you are know? two mixes you generally won't put together. Right. right? And I, you know, I, after a while, I'm just like, got so tired of like even responding to yeah. it. Cause I'm like, why does that matter? You know? Right. But, uh, that first year was just like, people didn't get me. They, you know, they, they didn't know where to put me. You know, it was very, um, at least that school, that, that middle school was very racially segregated. I, I will say, you know, that was just the, the truth and I didn't fit in anywhere. So, um, it was really hard for me, but once I got to high school, which was not that far from this middle school, it was, it, everything was different. Everyone, it was really diverse and everyone got along. Everyone was friends with friends. Like there was no issue, but that first year was really hard for me. I just didn't, you know, I didn't feel like I fit in. I didn't feel like I need to say, you know, I'm one or the other. I'm, you know, um, I'm me. Um, but I picked USC because uh, that was the best school that I applied to. I mean, I, you know, UCLA actually was always my dream school. And uh, I, um, I didn't feel like I could get in, so I didn't apply, which was so dumb on my part, you know. So USC was, had a solid journalism program, and that was kind of the focus at that point. So mm -hmm. that's why I ended up going there. But that was a, another culture shock as well, because I went from, I, we moved to Orange County when we moved from Utah. And then going to Los Angeles was just, whoa. Um, not kidding, but the first day of orientation, I drove from Orange County to Los Angeles, and there was a dead guy on the side of the freeway. Oh, my gosh. And there was cops and stuff, but the, the most disturbing part was that the cops were laughing and just, like, pretending. This like is a normal day. And it was like, it was obviously a carjacking because there was nothing around him. He had just been shot and it was just, he had a white shirt. It was horrible. And I'm like, wow, this is how I'm starting right. my first day of college orientation. And I told a bunch of people that story and they just kind of like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, like, oh yeah, that's normal kind of reaction. And I'm like, I don't really think that that's normal, you right. know, like I'm kind of really disturbed by this. 
Um, and, and USC is much nicer. Now. Actually, I would say USC is much nicer than UCLA now. Mm-hmm. But um, at the time, I mean, it was a place where, you know, you had to be on guard and make sure that you were doing everything safely and not doing anything, um, you know, to jeopardize your your own safety, I guess. Yeah. So. Where does the, you kind of mentioned earlier that like you always, seems like you've always been pretty switched on and kind of smart in that area. Where does that come from? Where does that love come from of education and learning or just naturally good at things? Um, my father was uh, an extremely smart man. Um, he, and my grandmother, his mother was super smart. I mean, he was the guy, uh, the one story I, I, I love telling people is that he was the one in math class when he was really young um, who would get bored. He was the bored kid. And the story goes that his teacher was so frustrated because he's just sitting back like, you know, what is this? And she's like, Dwayne, do you want to teach the class? And he's like, sure. Got up, took the chalk, you know, and finished the math problem. And he's like, and put it down and sat down. Like, he's like, what? Um, He would read like cowboy novels, like in a day, like thick, thick cowboy novels. Um, He ended up being an engineer for the Air Force, a super smart guy. We would watch Jeopardy together um, before he'd passed away. And um, he was the guy that could answer all of the questions. I mean, except for the, you know, things about music and, you know, modern culture. That was me. That was me. (laughs) Now I'm like, oh, Michael Jackson. But, um, yeah, he was a really smart person. Um, my mother, he had met her in Vietnam, mm-hmm. brought her and a bunch of her um, relatives um, from from Vietnam. And, uh, you know, he, I don't know, I think that, that maybe that's why they didn't end up staying together because she had, she was a, from a family of eight kids and she had to stop um going to school so she could provide for the family. So the education was like starkly different. And she never, she was never like a tiger mom or anything like that. She was just like, be grateful for your education. Be grateful that you can, you know, you can have those things. I didn't have that. So you have that opportunity, like use it. So I think that that kind of stuck with me, but I I already had a love of learning. Um, And now living here in a new place, love to learn. We're at the Hall of Fame. I want to go look around, yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, that's just kind of always been part of my personality. Yeah. So you finish UC, you, uh, USC and then you, you go on to do your doctorate at UCLA, right? Yes. What was the re- Was that like, is there a gap there or do you just know I'm going to go straight, stay in school. I'm finally going to apply to my dream place. I'm going to go. I, um, the trick is t- <laughs> to get into better uh, grad school is to take a year off because then they use the grades from your senior year. And the, my senior year at USC was the best grades I had. So I'm like, okay, I will do that. I was a paralegal at the real estate yeah. um, firm and then um, learned a lot, went to UCLA because it was, I mean, it's the top 15 school. So it was really yeah. like a huge, a huge deal. I actually... Um, when I got the email that I got in, it was on April Fool's Day, and I thought it was a joke. <laughs> Who's pranking you? Right? Yeah, I, I was like, wait, they're not sending like the official letter. Like, why do I get an email? So I had someone at the law firm who had gone to UCLA and graduated. He was like a first year. He called up the admissions office, like, are you guys sending email? You're not doing the letters anymore. Are you sending emails out? So he confirmed that I had gotten in, and um, at that point, uh, I still had a few law schools to hear back from but I already knew I'm like UCLA's it so yeah I was really happy about that yeah it's a pretty cool moment mm-hmm. right to get that and finally get to your your spot and also like for being a paralegal for a year you're just like I want to you know you're like I want to be a lawyer right like right. I want to go do this you know I can I can push paper for a year and deal with all these people that sometimes <laughs> you probably don't want to deal with and some some days you're probably glad to be away from them and go do like you know and then go for it and obviously you do that and how was that experience at UCLA was it everything you kind of dreamt, dreamt about uh law school's hard <laughs> when people uh, I was a mentor <laughs> I think they stopped asking me but I was a UCLA law like mentor for a couple of years after I graduated and I was just like are you sure <laughs> you know because uh your job is a, I mean law school is really just learning how to speak legally you know yeah. the legalese mm-hmm. and 
you don't know anything. You go in and you go into practice and then that's when you really learn. And uh, I kind of already knew that from the one year of um, being a paralegal. I mean, I learned a lot that one year, but, uh, you know, it was kind of strange, like, especially the real property professor I had, you know, we she'd bring up a topic, a case or something that kind of tied in with Mike's work experience. And I would go up to her afterwards and, you know, ask her questions. And she'd be like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, huh? Like, how do you not know? How do you not know? And she's like, I, I don't deal with that stuff. And I, you know, and I, I'm like, okay, that just the first, she doesn't know anything about that. And then something else came up that first year. And I was like, you know, I asked her again and she's like, I, I'm not really sure. I really don't know. And I'm I think that you are far removed from reality and how like real estate really works maybe because these are not like, I don't even know what the topic was, but it was not something, you know, convoluted at all. And yeah. she just had no practical experience. And I think that she had only really practiced for a couple of years. So she didn't really get a lot of um, real life work experience. So me knowing that like contracts was my favorite, you know, my favorite subject in my first year I did well, like, Cause I got it, you know, like I, mm. I dealt with some of that, you know, I didn't understand a bunch of, you know, the, some of the legalese details, but, um, it was a good experience, but it was, it was exhausting to read all the time. That's why I really think that the art just kind of came in. Cause it's just like my eyes need to rest. <laughs> they need to do something else besides, yeah. you know, review all these case, you know, these cases. And um, they're really just prepping you for the bar exam, which thankfully I, I passed the first time because I don't know. I, I didn't want to go through that again. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem like a fun process. There's so oh, much no. pressure on you, too. And then the, the, the amount of time that you wait to hear. Right. And then obviously everyone hears at the same time. And it's just like I had to I go watch it, a three hour movie. Like I I was like, I need something to pass the time because this yeah. is so stressful. So, so stressful. And that was a thing. Law school was a bunch of stress for three years. The last year was um, a little better. You, you know, you have some flexibility. You don't have to take all these bar classes. So yeah. I took animals and the law and women and the law and like random things like that. Um, and just worried about the bar study after we graduated. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What, um, what year did you graduate law school? What? What year did you graduate law school? What, when was this? 2001. Okay. So then you go into the corporate world, you start working and you finally... No, no? That, that was actually a really bad year. Okay. Um, so I was set with, um, you know, I got to do corporate law. I don't want to be a litigator. And a yeah. lot of my older friends from the year before, um, they were getting these huge... Uh, pay raises just to be a first year like it bumped up significantly and then uh the dot bomb era happened yeah and then everything kind of sank and then on top of that uh so when i graduated i was like i you know i had offers for to do litigation and i just didn't want to no, i knew I that that wasn't for me and i didn't want to pigeonhole myself because i knew that if you started down one road yeah you were going to end up being that bankruptcy lawyer you never wanted to be or, yeah. you know, that litigator you didn't want to be. So I, um, I held firm and I was fine. I'm fine. I'm graduating at, at top school. Like I will find something. And then nine 11 happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I literally were, was, you know, writing out letters and sending them out to people. And, um, I was like, okay, I got to take a break from that now because no one's going to be focused on this. Um, I, uh, I eventually got a job at a small um, uh, family-owned law firm. Um, the husband was the corporate lawyer, and the wife was the litigator. And, you know, they had a small little practice, and I worked there for a couple years. And then got into the bigger firm where I ended up doing um, more entertainment-type, uh, mm -hmm. uh, had entertainment-type cl uh, clients. And, you know, that was... yeah. A better experience, but yet again, more stress. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it just, um, I don't know, you know, I thought being an entertain like entertainment, it was really entertain entertainment finance. So you think that your clients um, have it easy, but they actually work more than you do because, you know, they're just go-getters. It was kind of crazy. Um, but just 
mergers and acquisitions, things like that. I learned a lot of different um, types of areas while I was in corporate law. I mean, it's, I won't bore you with them, but, um, you know, I worked at the SEC when I was at U UCLA, so I did some inter insider trading there, but, you know, those filings, I mean, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of paperwork. It's yeah. a lot, a lot of paper, and I'm still dealing with paper, right. but, you know, nice, pretty paper. Yeah, <laughs> that gives you a totally different reaction to being served, right? Yes, yes, It's, it's sure. a lot more fun to send someone a card. Yes. Um, so it says, obviously, that you started um, Kiss and Punch 2010. Um, well, before that, I actually yeah. did wedding invitations. Okay. Um, so you do of, the cards for family and then the invitations. Yeah, a lot of people kind of do the same thing where they, uh, and that, at that point I was using, I mean, um, printing myself too. Yeah. So um, the wedding industry is hard. I mean, I, I mean it's easy because you know a lot of people that get married and have one invitations and things like that. So getting the work is easy enough, but... Oh man, I had a couple experiences with groomzillas, and that was enough for me to be like, okay, I am, yeah. I'm done. Uh, let's try greeting cards. And at first, I was really intimidated because I didn't know what my style really was. I just thought, oh, okay, you need birthday, you need that, you know, all these different topics, and um, kind of went with that. But I still, it took it took a while to kind of um, find my voice. Um, actually, a uh, year after getting into um, greeting cards, I had printed a um, a kind of like a it was a Facebook status card. It was you know congratulations on your change status, and it looked like like the, the old Facebook, mm -hmm. um, like a snapshot of it. And uh, I actually got that mentioned in a Wall Street Journal. Um, story about stationery, how stationery was making a comeback. So when I had st stumbled in that stationery store and saw all these letterpress printed cards, that was like a revolution, like that was starting up. And um, people were finding these antique presses and, you know, learning how they worked because, you know, this was something that pressmen did and, you know, this is not something that a lot of normal artists were, um, were even lear learning or doing in, in school in design school. So that was like a revolution and like getting into that was, I was like one of the early, early people doing that. But, um, yeah, I lost my train. <laughs> I mean, so the, you're doing obviously kiss and punch while you're in work. Yeah. Tell me about that transition then. Tell me about that, like that. I mean, are, are you at this point working towards thinking, wow, I can really do this. I'm going to, like, was the goal from start just be like, I'm going to sell this stuff. And, and or when you get those first couple of sales, you think, man, I can really do this for the rest of my life. Well, now I remember the, the Wall Street Journal thing is really kind of what opened my eyes. Yeah. Uh, I had one little paragraph. She interviewed me for like 10 minutes. She put one little blurb about me that it was a small studio in Los Angeles, had a Facebook card. And then all these retailers from around the country started um, messaging me on Etsy. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, do you sell wholesale? Do you, I had at that point, I don't even know how many cards I had. I maybe like six. Yeah. So I didn't know, you know, much about it. And um, but I kept getting, you know, inquiries that I thought I need to look into this. Maybe this is how I scale up. Is by you know selling wholesale because then you're making a bunch of cards and then you're just selling but I didn't know anything about it so I ended up taking some um, courses on um, how to sell wholesale because I had no idea and then uh, actually a retailer in Portland told me about the National Stationery Show which doesn't exist anymore but at that point she said that's the place to be if you want to grow your business you need to figure that out and so I walked it um, in 2011, and I thought, okay, great, I'm gonna do this. Like, I need to figure out how, but I'm gonna do this. And, um, you know, I, I was kind of intimidated because this is not your typical trade show. The, these people <laughs> had stationary lines, but they looked like stores. Like, they were so intricate and so detailed, and a lot of these a lot of my stationary colleagues are just really talented and more more than just you know cards, and so they they made these beautiful um, booths and stuff. And I was like, wow, I I got to really figure this out. So while I was 
um, well, the next year I got pregnant, so I had my son. <laughs> got rid of all of my uh, printing press uh, equipment. Took I a just, break. Yeah. I, no, I got rid of it because I didn't feel like it was safe. Oh, sure. For a little Fair. baby yeah. to be around any heavy equipment like that. So I found um, my pressman who I still use. And, um, you know, he prints all of my things. And thankfully, I know everything about letterpress to know when there's an issue or not. And um, so I skipped that year. And then I, I debuted the following year. And I did that national, tra- national stationery show for four years in a row. Um, some of my first uh, retailers, you know, were from actually Oklahoma. Chirps and Cheers, that's yeah. in OKC. Mm-hmm. Um, they were originally in Edmond, I think, with the previous owner, and they were one of my first stores to carry my line, so that was you know, really great. And uh, there was another one that uh, was in Norman called Postscript, but they've, um, they're, not, they're not in business anymore. So it was, great to meet, um, it was great to meet retailers in person. And I did this on the down low. Like, I was at Honda, and I was like, I have to have this week off this whole week and so I basically dedicated myself to flying to New York not answering any emails no phone calls nothing and just focused on doing the show for four years in a row and then um, yeah that they got to be the the more I did the show the more I grew and the harder it got to be to, to juggle it all I literally would be at my desk and I would have I would be folding cards under my desk and I had like a glass I didn't have any privacy. I didn't even have a door. It was just a glass wall. So, like, if you really pay attention to what I was doing, I'm, like, folding cards to, like, um, put together wholesale and retail orders. And if you were in the mailroom, you knew because I have this little pretty package, this, like, big box of stuff. But most people weren't paying attention to what I was doing. So um, I did that for five years, and then I I retired from law on April Fool's uh, 2015. Nice. Yeah. Full on, like from, from day to like get your offer from UCLA. To, right, right. To the, yeah, that's I really cool. That yeah, now. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, so yeah, you go to this, you go to the show and you get your, you know, opens your eyes. And then like you said that you're, you're into this, like for the next five years, when, when do you decide then? Do you decide like that, you know, this might be, is it like the year that you decided to retire from law? Or, I mean, sounds like you when you have your mindset on something you're going to do it although it's for fun like clearly you're getting wholesale orders you're making money from it there's a reason that you kept working at it and you love doing it when was the moment that you're like you know what i'm doing this i'm pulling the trigger i'm working towards this i'm gonna i'm gonna retire from law and actually like this is going to be my full-time business um the juggling started taking a toll on me yeah um i got to the point where um i would get sick for like a month which just never, you know, happened in my life. And it got to the point where I was going to the doctor all the time. And he's like, I can't just keep giving you antibiotics. It's not working. Right. Like, what are you doing? And I, you know, I tell, I, I tell him, I'm like, I'm taking all the stuff you're saying, you know. And he's like, you need to rest. Not to mention your mother as well. Right. At this point, you need right? to you're rest. Newborn. Like, you, you know, that, I think that's the only medicine I can, or yeah. advice I can give you is just... Prescribe you 10 hours of sleep a night. <laughs> eight to, eight sleep. to 10 hours. I mean, it was at the point where, like, they wouldn't let me... This is before you worked at home. And yeah. it's a Japanese company, so, you know, FaceTime means a lot to them. So, you know, I worked from home, but it wasn't... It was, like, intense. Like, you are leading this meeting. This is before Zoom, so it was like, okay, guys, you know, let's go through this and it wasn't easy because there was no zoom. So it was really difficult. And, you know, I wasn't resting. And, um, at the same time I felt like, okay, I'm steadily growing, but I don't feel like I could ever get kiss and punch to where I want it if I don't do this full time. Yeah. And then, you know, you're grappling with, am I really going to give up a six figure salary to do this? And benefits and all the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The benefits were insane, insane there. I paid like $30 a month for like coverage for all of us. It was, you know, so I really had, you know, I grappled with, but you're right. Like once I make a decision, I'm going to go for it. So, um, you know, one thing that really we tried to do for, um, before I knew I was going to quit was try to find a house. And in Los Angeles, 
that's pretty daunting. Um, we, I, I don't even know how many times we, you know, put in offers and we just got heartbroken over and over and over again that it got to the point where it's just before I quit that I was like, you know what, we have to stop. Like I'm already getting sick. I'm already like all of these things. I can't have the stress of trying to find a place. And you know, it's like, you know, you try to find a place that's cheaper, but not in that great of a neighborhood or, you know, a nice neighborhood, but it's like a place you completely have to gut or, you know, completely renovate. So, you know, you're making a lot of compromises and it was just so much stress that I was like, I, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And I just, I don't want to put any more energy into this because it's just, it's too heartbreaking. Like my heart is yeah. broken. I need to like just chill out. And so you know, I quit and, you know, we stay renting a condo and we're in that, we were in that building until I moved here. And it just, you know, I just never, it just kept going up. Like at that point I'm like, well, even if I'm making a ton of money with kiss and punch, like this is hard. Mm -hmm. And when you're self-employed, it's a lot harder also to get a loan, which, you know, I didn't really, really realize too. So um, there are a lot of things that I wish people had told me before I quit, but you know, you learn while you do all these things you figure out when you're like <laughs> in the middle of like, Oh yes. Just like, like insurance. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just was like, I don't, I don't want to keep doing this to myself. Um, at that point I'm already ready to leave California. Yeah. Um, before I had quit, um, my last corporate job though, I had a friend who was originally from LA. Her husband was originally from LA, didn't like it, didn't want to stay there. And they had this great idea. They, they didn't know where they wanted to go. And so for two, maybe three years, she told me that every three day weekend, every vacation, they went somewhere in the country yeah. and they went all over the place, like North Carolina, Portland, Seattle, like all over the country. And they were like, they're determined, they were determined to find their home. And I kept telling that to my husband. I was like, this is what we need to do because I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I, all I know is that the longer we stay here, the further away it's going to be attainable to find a place. And yes, I said that I wanted to cool it with trying to find a place, but man, what are we going to do? Um, I don't want to be here like forever. And at first he didn't take me very, he didn't take me seriously. He was like, okay, Hawaii, let's go to Hawaii. And I'm like, that is even worse than California. Right. Like what? No, like it's good to visit, but I, I mean, right. no. Living that's, expenses, everything's imported for the most part. That's like, insane. It's, yeah, it's crazy. So um, then uh, COVID happens and then my whole, like everything changes. I had just signed a lease um, for a new studio um, cause I wanted to take everything. I was split for all those years. I was splitting my son's room. He had a math. We had two master bedroom. It was a two master bedroom condo, but I was splitting kiss and punch was in that room. He didn't have a closet. It was all of my envelopes. And then I just had inventory and I had a, a certain system that it all fit, but it got to be overwhelming. Like the orders were just coming and it was just taking so long. And I'm like, I need a better system. So February 2020 signed a lease for uh, a studio space and then everything, you know, mm -hmm. gets locked down. And um, that's when, to me, everything changes in Los Angeles. Um, my son was in second grade at the time. You know, they finished out that year, but then he starts uh, third grade and everything is still locked down. I, I don't know about here, but everything there was, you know, you couldn't do much. I have friends that didn't go to the grocery store for three years, you know, like things like that. So um, he starts third grade and that's kind of a transition for kids. They, they go from, you know, just fun little projects to like, no, you got to read this and you got to answer questions. You get, you're more involved, you're writing, you're doing all these new things. So this is how he has to start third grade is virtually. And it's awful. It's really awful. Um, you know, he has these really sweet teacher, but you know, kids, they don't know what to do with zoom. Right. And, yeah. um, it was kind of heartbreaking to watch him every day because, you know, if he got asked a question and he didn't answer correctly, 
he saw himself on the screen fail. He saw the teacher's reaction. He saw his classmates' reactions. And over that first semester, it just got to be too much. That by the end of uh, that first semester, his teacher had agreed that he could just draw a face on his hand and participate this way. And I was like, wow, um, let's look in a homeschool. Yeah. So um, I thought it would just be a temporary thing. And uh, so that next semester, I pull him out of, I would draw him from the school and, you know, we just kind of use all the materials he already had. And we, I start teaching him. I'm like, well, I love school. I love learning. You know, I can teach you. It's, it's fine. And uh, I thought that he was at a 9, 10 school. Like, this is like a top-notch elementary school. He did not know so much. I was, I was upset. I was like, you should know this. Yeah. You really should know this. So we were going to work on this. And as his teacher, you know, he ended up thriving. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder what we should do. Meanwhile, the school still hasn't opened yet. I think that his school in LAUSD was one of the last schools in the entire country to reopen. I want to say April is when it you know, finally opened, which is only one more month before school ends. Yeah. So at that point, I'm like, you know, I'll just be your homeschool teacher. I, I, I'm confident enough to go all the way through middle school if you want, and then let's just try to find a place that we can move because everything in LA at that point just becomes tent city. Yeah. It's like really depressing. And I'm still in Westwood. I'm still by UCLA. Like I didn't even, even left the area and it's just, it gets progressively worse and worse and worse and unsafe mm -hmm. that like I have a studio that's only a mile away. And sometimes I would call my husband and be like, Hey, can you come over and help me? And he's like, what do you need help with? I'm like, I need to go to my car. <laughs> like what do you mean I'm like there's just some people around I'm just I'm by myself there's no one I, I was at the my studio was above uh, another retail uh, retail business so but I was there by myself right. and I was just like I don't feel safe no. so he had to do that for me multiple times and um, taking the idea that my friend had about going to different places finally uh you know, November 2021, we decide to take a long trip to Florida because lots of friends have moved to Florida, Texas, Tennessee. And I'm like, maybe, like, let's, let's let's try it out. It's not it's not Hawaii, but, yeah. you know. The sun shines. There's, there's sun there. Yeah. Um, so we go, we, we go from Jacksonville, you know, we hit St. Augustine and Orlando, like all of these cities. We end up in Sarasota and then fly out and nothing. Um, we love St. Augustine for the history, but it's a tourist town, so we don't really know if that really is gonna fit us. And um, it gets, we come back and I'm just like, I, I, I'm i frustrated, like, I just wanna get out of here. At that point, like, I could get out of my, um, I could get out of my studio lease, but, you know, there's flexibility now. You're, I'm homeschooling my son. My my husband works from home. Like I work from home. I mean, we can go anywhere. Anywhere you want to go. And so, um, how I land in Oklahoma is weird because it has nothing to do with anybody. I actually have cousins who live in Moore, but every time I would see them, I always saw them in California. I never came to visit. Um, they are like, "Oh, Oklahoma's so boring. You don't. Want, you don't. Want, you don't need to come. We'll come here." And they would come. They would come every summer. Um, never said anything other than boring. So I thought, oh, okay, you know. But in 2021, I start going on social media more. I, I see it's helping my business. And I get on TikTok. And um, on TikTok, I seem to really, like, uh, connect with a lot of people from Texas and Oklahoma and, like, just this general area. And a friend on TikTok sends me, you know, I start talking about it too. I go on lives and I start saying, you know, like, help me. I need to leave California. I don't know where to go. Um, and they send me this article that says, you know, the top five most affordable states in the country. And it's like Mississippi and Alabama, I think Arkansas and yeah. Oklahoma. I don't remember the fifth one. Missouri, I think, is pretty cheap too. Yeah, that, yeah. that, that might be it. And... Well, I have family in Moore. 
I don't know what that means, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll maybe I'll I'll think about it. So November 2022, I just spontaneously take a solo trip out here, and I fall in love. It's kind of crazy, like landing I'm like there's nothing here like we're we're there's no mountains at all it is so flat um but I you know I I go to Bricktown I go downtown I see how clean and safe it is the energy is amazing the people are so friendly it reminds me of my childhood and then I see all the cows and um horses I don't think I mentioned but when I when I was in Utah my grandpa had a small farm he had some cows and pigs, and then his next door neighbor had horses that I would ride any chance that I got. So um, all of that comes like flooding back. And uh, I see, I just see a flash of Lake Hefner, and I'm like, wow, there's a lake house and a man made lake? Like, I don't get it, but I love it. <laughs> and it's just, it's just, it's just amazing. And it takes some time. I come back, and I'm, you know, I should, I should back up, but. When I'm at the airport leaving that first weekend, I'm at Will Rogers and the most amazing, the brightest orange sun, sunset ever just comes, sh you know, shooting through the terminal. And I'm like, wow, this place is incredible. And I just, I leave with a lot of hope because I, I saw the house prices. I was like, are you kidding me? Like this house would be $2 million in my neighborhood in Westwood. Are you, it's just insane. And I love, you know, I love everything about it. And it was more diverse than I thought, you know, like my family really, you know, I would have been here sooner had they told me more about what it was like. Cause they, they've been thriving. They had been thriving here for years yeah. and, you know, never really said anything. So I was like, well, I'm trying to keep it a secret. <laughs> and that's what I think. I, yeah. I felt like it, Oklahoma is like the best kept secret in America. Like, I want to tell people and I want to shout it, you know, off rooftops, but at the same time, like, don't come here. <laughs> Please don't come here. Only if you've been approved because, right. you know, we need nice people here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and since I've moved here and it was a struggle to move here, too. Like I came back and, you know, my family is like, what? Oklahoma? Really? Are you serious? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, let me just take you. Let me take you. And every time we came, we, we made, well, I made five total trips before we actually moved here. But it was four trips with family. And it was like, just, you know, it's diverse. It's more than, it's more than you think. And it's, it's kind of weird how so many people have, uh, you know, these weird notions about Oklahoma, they have no idea. And I, I don't feel like yeah. a lot of Oklahomies like necessarily correct them. And I'm fine with that. You know, I'm fine doing the same. <laughs> oh yeah. Just think whatever you want to think. It's just a bunch of cows. Yeah. yeah. Tornadoes, horse and carts. You never want to live right. here. It's terrible. Right. Yeah. 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 Stay out. Little do they know <laughs> it's like foodie heaven. Right. You know, my sister had told me, um, before I moved here, she said, I will visit you once and that is it. And I was like, whoa, what? Because your family, I'm going to visit you once. Right. And I was like, oh, we have to make it so awesome when she gets here. Yeah. And so she came and uh, I, I had my housewarming party like the weekend that she was, she was here. And I took her to all of my favorite places. And I remember she, she has this thing when she goes to a new city, she, she has to have the donuts. And I'm like, I don't... Ooh, I don't know of a donut place. I don't really do donuts. And for her sake, I was like, okay, let's go on Yelp. I'm going to look and find something. And I found like a five-star um, donut place, fresh donuts. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like, it's got good ratings. Let's try it. Uh, take her. And I think it's open from like 5 to 12. And we got there like almost 1130. So it was really late. And I show up and it's like, there's barely anything in, in the in the cases. I was like, well, let's let's go for the fritters. There's a cronut, all of these things. And the woman is so nice. She's so sweet. You can tell she just puts so much love into what she makes. And I walked away and I was like, she's getting a five star for me because, right. you know, like and they were incredible on top of that. And it was at that point my sister was eating the donuts back at our house that She's like, I think we'll come back. We'll definitely come back. And I was like, yeah. 
Yes. Which yeah. what donut place was it? Fresh Donuts. Um, okay. Shout out Fresh Donuts. Yes. For persuading so. your sister to come back. <laughs> oh, and she's already. She's like, when are we? When are we, when, when when are we, are we doing back? this again? Yeah. She's a professor at at a North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, yeah. which I had considered moving to as well. I was like, I just need to get out of. I just need to get out of California. Yeah. You said you're a foodie. What, I'm a well, low-key foodie. Yes, but still, like, I consider myself a low-key foodie, too. I mean, the Scottish, I got the Scottish tongue, so mm-hmm. I can't eat a lot of spicy. Same. Um, so, uh, there's just, uh, when we had, um, when we had come to, like, house hunt, we stumbled upon a Peruvian restaurant in Edmond, and we go there every week. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Zambrano's. And that first time that we went there, we actually met with the owner and he told his story. You know, he talked about how he came from Peru and went to Miami initially and tried to make it there. And it was such a struggle. Like you, he couldn't get ahead. And he had a friend who had just moved to Oklahoma, you know, and basically told him, like, if you want to live the American dream, come to Oklahoma. And so he did, and he, and he opened a restaurant. And it's amazing. It's amazing food, like yeah. pollo saltado. It's really good. It's sick. <laughs> uh, I should have asked you this sooner, but what? Why name? What? What's Kiss and Punch? Why? Why? Why name it that? Right. So my very first letterpress class, I learned about um, the two techniques for printing. Um, so the letterpress is the the printing press is like super old, centuries old, um, fifth century, I think. And back then when they would print the Bible, for instance, um, you know, the pressman would put all the type in for the page, like page three, and then put the paper in and he'd kiss the paper. So he'd kiss the paper so once it dried, he could flip it over and do page th- do the same thing and do page, page four. So that's the kiss technique. Okay. But when I was talking about when I was... Um, stumbled upon the stationery store, the new technique was to punch it. Gotcha. And to punch it is, you, I don't use uh, tree paper. I use cotton paper, so it's cushy. And so you, you know, you pad the press and then you punch, you know, it's punching the image into the paper and so you can feel the texture. I should have brought you some, sorry. Okay. You can feel the texture of the artwork and that's what makes it special. Gotcha. Where, uh, where and I guess how did you develop uh, when not where when and how do you develop like your style into kind of like the the products that you have because I think you know you you obviously have a sense of humor in your style <laughs> um, you know so where, where does that come from and also then that fits you into you know your USP or you know um, for the business it was through the trade show I mean the trade shows were great in New York because you got real live reactions it's different from doing like a craft show in person when it's just a consumer. But the trade shows, it's the retailer who has a store who knows how to sell cards Mm -hmm. and gives you their feedback. And, um, oh, you know, one of the first punny cards I did, my, again, my sister, she's going to really hate, she's going to really hate me for saying You can name her if you want to shout her out. (laughs) Come back to Oklahoma. I call her Teeny. Yeah. Um, I came out with the, Hope you have an unforgettable birthday. And I drew a little simple um, bowl of pho. Yeah. And that's a Vietnamese uh, yeah. pun. Yeah. And she's like, no one's going to know what that is. And I'm like, but, but you people will, right? eat pho all the time. It's not, it's, it's not just, a, you know, our own culture thing. It's, it's, it's everybody mm-hmm. now. It's totally everybody. And she's like, I don't think so, but you can try it. And I'm like... It was, it was a hit. And I was actually, and I'm going to say this, I was actually the first person to do that, pho, and then it's, you know, it's taken off since then. And, you know, people have done way better than me with that car, but uh, that uh, pun. But, like, a lot of Vietnamese restaurants would be punny. And so I got a kick out of it. I saw the retailers' reactions to it. And wordplay was always a thing I had with my dad, too. Dad jokes, I mean, come on. Um, so I just thought this would be really fun and some of the few ones that I would do here and there you know would sell well so I'm like maybe this is what my my niche is I need to focus on that and I'm not a you know uh I'm kind of a big dill kind of 
prone right. person, I, I need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. So I will spend hours trying to figure out something. If I, I just recently did a hamster cart and I haven't drawn a hamster yet. So I'm like, I need to think of something. I, you know, it's gotta be different. I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. I, I want, it's gotta be unique and it's gotta be me. So, yeah. um, I definitely try to do puns that are not already out there, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes that's what people want. And here and there I'll be like, fine, fine, I'll do it. But, um, I'm always trying to make it different and challenge myself. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, like, that's kind of like, how do you keep progressing? Right. How do you keep making it different and fresh? And right. that it is obviously, and obviously your kind of lawyer background and, and way with words and learning, you know, just reading a dictionary, basically just to find words, but also it needs to be funny. And, you know, the dad jokes, I think ties into to right. something you remember about you and your dad. Right. Which no, is nice. True. Yeah. To have that come back around. But how about, um, kind of like the process then of, of like and how that's changed over the years of you know yeah you're drawing stuff but also now with like AI you could probably just type into chat GPT hey give me a cartoon character of this like is that because that I been haven't different? used chat GPT for that for the actual artwork yeah. um, I've seen some amazing things so right. I definitely want to kind of see what they come up with yeah but I did a I did a TikTok live maybe like six months ago and I needed um, some pun ideas for um, a trade show, a small trade show I was doing it, and they wanted, um, they had a punny card category for you to, to try to, yeah, it was a contest. So basically, you, you, if you got punny award, then it would be displayed at the actual trade show. Yeah. And I was on a live, I'm like, let's use chat GPT because you guys aren't coming up with great stuff. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know what it was, but I, you know, I typed in a bunch of things and they're just, it's not, the AI is not there yet. No, it's not. Sorry. You know, maybe for the images, it would give me some ideas of like how to, you know, okay, this is a good position for an animal or something unique or something like right. that. But the the puns were awful. Oh, they were so awful. Inside jokes is not there yet. Yeah, it doesn't have a like, sense of humor. And it would keep giving me the same one. I'm like, you know, <laughs> how about more? How, whatever you have yeah, to say to. Be funny and it's not. It was horrible. Oh, and yeah. I did not win that award because I used. <laughs> use something that they came up with and everyone on the chat or on the live was like yeah use that one and it was horrible I didn't even really print it yeah. I just I came up with the concept submitted it and then I was like nah that was horrible you mentioned being on live a few times and obviously social media is a huge part of your business tell me about that and how that's aided you and helped you sell the product well I'm pretty ridiculous <laughs> I love being ridiculous I think on TikTok I, I have this problem of I want to do the trend or I want to do something that's funny to okay. me. I mean, apologies to all the, my, my fans that like me to like show their order, but it's really boring. <laughs> it's so boring. It's like, you know, Kate got this and I can show you the cards and it's fine. It's an easy way to do um, social media, but it gets really boring and I need to entertain myself. So um, lives, I... People told me during, when I was doing my lives on TikTok that they really got to know me better. And even though I did all the ridiculous stuff and they see my, you know, silly puns and whatnot on my actual products, that they really got to know me. So I thought that was nice, but, you know, that's really time consuming too. And um, TikTok has changed so much in the last six months that uh, it's kind of stopped doing that because TikTok shop just kind of took over. But um, yeah, I just. If I see a funny trend and if I can apply it to my business, yeah. I love doing that. It's, you know, I think it's showing me. People might be like, what is wrong with this girl? <laughs> but uh, it's me. That's me. You yeah. know, um, if it's not entertaining to me, I'm not going to post it. So, um, yeah, it's just so there's only so many order videos and look at what I just printed kind of videos. I just want it to be different, just like the, w the way my, my brand is in my line. Mm -hmm. I just want it to be different. So um, it's funny. I, I was doing all of this and just not thinking twice about it. And I went and walked a trade show. I didn't um, actually exhibit in it. And all of these people were like, I know you. I know you. And I was like, oh, boy. And it was all because of social media. I'm like, 
you don't like my stuff, but you're definitely watching. So yeah. it's working whether I think it's not, you know, think it is or I think it isn't. So Yeah. Well, and also like you left the corporate world to enjoy yourself every day right. and do something, right? So right. regardless if people like it or not, you're going to go enjoy yourself and put your personality into it and create your own personal brand regardless of the product. Like you can be you completely and the world, like I said, I think appreciates that right. and gets to see you do, you know, do the funny things, do the trends, but like, you know, that's one thing you scroll your business page or your page for Kiss and Punch and like, it's a lot of, it, it's you all you know, in everything, right? It's not just, like you said, it's not just, oh, product. Like there's a lot of like personality there that people connect with. And the one thing you get from putting yourself out there is people feel like they really get to know you. Right. Right. And then they're going to buy from you. Right. And like I said, that constant reminder, you know, people, because it's very hard to track posting on social media daily and it's something that you have to trust that by doing this every single day whoops by doing this every single day you you know are just reinforcing this to people and it's only times when you walk that trade show and you have people come up to you and you're like i know you yeah. right because you do these videos and you're like i have no idea who that person is but clearly they're watching <laughs> and one day they might send me a wholesale order right. or their business might you know or they've referred to their their boss hey you should order for this person yeah. it's just very hard to track Unless you get those personal interactions. Right. It's totally worth doing that. Yeah. And I've built, you know, relationships with retailers through social media too. Just, you know, DMing each other. They see something ridiculous that I do and they make a comment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we build a friendship off of that. And I think that's great. I mean, I'm putting myself out there. You're already putting yourself out there when you do cards. Whether people realize that or not, yeah. you know, this is your perspective on how birthdays should be celebrated or how, you know, this is your your sense of humor. And you're putting yourself out there. And social media is just, you know, the same thing. Because some people are like, are you really like this in person? And I say, yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> I really am this yeah. crazy. Hopefully people have figured this out from the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that you're a bubbly and have a personality. And, you know, you're not, like, suppressed like you might have felt in a corporate world. Right, right. Because right? you can't really, you know, act like bubbly and first you gotta be straight laced and serious and yes that's why i got corporate. in trouble for doodling <laughs> in school and in uh, you know yeah. work life so, yeah. so how, how over the years then have you like developed a business grown i see you have a bunch of, you know don't just do cards you have stickers notepads totes you do a lot of wholesale stuff as well like how has that been to take this seriously grow the business and you know have a have a product and a brand that you know you can focus on every day it's pretty amazing. It's kind of mind boggling. I'm I'm in my thirteenth year of selling cards and uh you know, you do the trade shows to try to get into you know, mom and pop brick and mortars, but you also do it to try to, you know, attract um big box stores. And so I've had my cards in Urban Outfitters and Paper Source, which I don't think they have in Oklahoma. Or maybe they have it in Tulsa, I'm not sure, but um, that's like a stationary uh, superstore kind of all over the country. And, uh, you know, Barnes & Noble bought them uh, back in 2021, and I just got, you know, a card in Barnes & Noble. So um, that's a whole other, you know, beast in and of itself, trying to get those uh, orders for big boxes um, together. But, um, you know, wholesale is a big part of the business. Um, I feel like, you know, social media on Instagram is really for that portion, the wholesale business. But I've been trying to grow my TikTok just to, you know, connect with consumers directly mm -hmm. and um, build upon that. Because that's how I started. You know, I started selling on Etsy and I still sell on Etsy. Um, but I sell on all these other platforms, you know. Um, I'm on Amazon handmade. It's just like, it's a lot of work. You know, you, you think someone asked um, the other day, how many hours do you think you work on your business every week? And I'm like 40 hours at least, at least yeah. I work more now than I did as a lawyer, yeah. but it's so much more fulfilling that, you know, I don't even notice, no. you know, I, when I you're doing what too. you love, it's, you know, it's not, a, I don't know. You, you just don't feel the same. You know, I don't get sick very often now, thankfully. You know. Yeah, this is kind of like good work for the soul, right? It's kind of happy to the brain and right. it's because you control it. Yes, you work more hours, but it's more more fulfilling and it's not like grinding over reviewing documents and getting a deadline out. It's that like, means no. nothing to you, yeah. yeah. I mean, if I have a deadline now, it's to try to design something in time for, 
you know, a show or some other, you know, some other big thing. And um, even that now, I'm trying to like, take a step back and, you know, not push myself to like design just a design. You know, I want it to be, I, you know, I told myself, because someone's like, you know, how long do you think you can do this business? And I'm like, as long as I still have ideas. As long as I can draw and have ideas. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. now with like an iPad and an Apple Pencil, like way easier you know yeah. I before I used to <laughs> on you know tracing paper the you know paper and you know scan it in mm -hmm. the designs have changed so much since then um and you know as long as I can keep coming up with punny stuff then I'll keep going you know yeah. So. yeah what um do you have any advice for anyone who, who just like you know obviously Back in the back when you were talking about just being a kid and didn't know you could have a career in this. Obviously, kids growing up now, some kids are in middle school making plenty of money already. <laughs> you know, like, is there anyone that's come to you for advice or, or stuff that like you would just tell people to, you know, not maybe not go to the corporate world or take that one year off after college? I mean, what's? I've definitely told people that yeah. um, when people like hear my story and. Some people are interested in, not in the kiss and punch. They're interested in the corporate stuff. And should I go to law school? And I, I'm, I'm brutally honest. I'm a Sagittarius. I'm brutally honest. So I tell them, you know, this is the reality. When you are a lawyer, your job is to worry. Do you like to worry? Because I don't, you know, uh, it's, it's high stress. So you, you have to keep that in mind. And if that's something I have plenty of friends who are still lawyers to this day, they love it. It's their passion. The same way I'm passionate about my, my business, they're passionate about law. Cool. Make sure that's you though, because otherwise you're wasting a lot of time, a lot of stress, a lot of energy. Um, and on the creative side, it's just, you know, if you can find something that you're good at and that you know you feel like you could make a career out of it then try it um i tell my that my son that all the time he wants to start a youtube channel and i'm like all right let's do it i'm a homeschool teacher i can you know we can incorporate this into the curriculum and so we're doing that he right now he's on the writing portion like we are trying to teach him how to write and you know sometimes he gives me ideas for trends and things to do and i'm like I don't think so, but, <laughs> yet. Yeah. Um, but for him, you know, I'm like, you could be the next Mr. Beast. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you got to try it though. And if this is something that you're passionate about, then you're going to, you know, you're going to study it and we're going to, you know, give you, I, I'm going to share anything I can, you know, give him as far as like my own background and how, how that could help him, you know, and see what happens with that. I mean, I think a lot of people, the, the biggest issue is just fear. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of uh, friends who um, I, I left in the corporate world don't even really want to do it, and they're still doing it. It's like, you, you're a talented photographer. Go do that. And, you know, put some effort into it that maybe you can turn that from a side hustle into a full-time gig. Like, you can do it. Um, you just got to be focused on it and, you know, not let fear kind of hold you back. Mm -hmm. So... Do you probably wish sometimes you'd done it a lot sooner? Yes. Right. I'm in the sooner state. I wish I had done it way sooner. Yeah. For sure. Um, it's, uh, it's crazy. I mean, um, all those, you know, all those years of stress and then gray hair to show for it. No, thanks. You know, like I could have prevented all of that, but I just didn't have anyone who could tell me that that was something that you could do. I feel like, you know, these days kids have it. You, you want to learn about something, you can go on YouTube and watch a whole bunch of videos and see if this kind of fits you or not. I remember when I was a kid, I, I looked up, um, how to be a comedian kind of, it was some kind of book. And, uh, I read it in elementary school and I was like, Whoa, that's a lot of pressure. No, <laughs> not going to do that. You know, cause I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do yeah. um, when I got older. And that's why the whole corporate lawyer thing kind of happened. Cause I just was, was not sure. I'm like, I'm not going to be a, engineer in the air force like my dad you know um i i don't know what to do so but kids these days like they want to be a comedian they can watch these videos they can study them they can do all these things they have you know they have made really yeah. there's no excuse if they got the free time to do it then they should try so i try to kind of impart that kind of uh belief system in my son i don't know if it's working <laughs> 
but we'll see when he starts, you know, his YouTube channel. Yeah. Subconsciously, I'm sure it'll be, it'll always be there, right? Because the good thing about having, being homeschooled and, and obviously being around an entrepreneur as yourself, like he's always going to see that. Right. Regardless if he hears it from you and listens, he's always going to have that example of you like doodling after dinner or just grinding or whatever it is, like just working on something that like, you know, 10, 15 years from now, he's going to be like, oh, like, you know, where does that work ethic come from? Well, it comes from an example of mum doing right. this every night. And even though she loved it, it was still work, but it right. was working towards something you love to do rather right. than like, like you said, kind of reviewing documents after work. That's just like, God, they clearly visually, they can see that you're frustrated with what you're doing. Yeah. Um, what, um, sounds like you're, you're a continual learner as well yes for sure what, what what's kind of the focus at the moment what do you are you a youtube learner are you a big reader kind of what what do you how do you learn and what are you learning both. right now definitely both yeah. um right now I'm, I'm honestly enjoying learning about oklahoma okay. i mean i think anywhere you grow up you learn about whatever state you're in so um i didn't know much about the sooner state at all. So I'm loving exploring when people, when family and friends do come, you know, other than taking them to my favorite foodie places, you know, uh, I still want to explore the pigeon museum. I mean, that's just great. You know, yeah. I've gone to the skeleton museum multiple times now. I just think it's really awesome. So I'm really loving learning about Oklahoma now yeah. because even that first trip, even though I fell in love at all the way back then, like, every day is something new and it's it's great even that ice storm the other day i was like wow you know <laughs> uh this is different for me um so i'm really loving that and uh you know just enjoying my time here my cousins now when they introduce me to friends they say this is my cousin julie she came from california and she loves it here and i just crack up because i'm like yes and what's crazy to me, and I don't, I don't, I don't see this, but people say when I got here in August that they can tell that I'm so much happier on social media. Like, what is it about me? Like, I'm the same goofy person. Like, I don't see it. What are you seeing that I'm not seeing? But they can tell. And I think that's great. You know, mm -hmm. that makes me so happy that somehow that's translating in some in some way yeah have you read Boomtown yet no okay. I listened to you that to podcast read, yeah, so you need I need to read that, read book. that book yeah the book's great and it'll kind of give you appreciation for Oklahoma City as well and just the funny little stories in that um, but yeah I mean obviously this building's great full of history of, of kind of the state and the people in it um, the Oklahoma History Museum's really good right. pop over there it's great um, Cowboy Hall of Fame is fantastic My too love that. yeah you'd <laughs> love that and, and uh, yeah do all that stuff I mean there's so many like the, that's the good thing about here is like there's so many things that you can kind of experience and for the most part they're pretty quiet like you're not gonna like you can go to the um the bombing memorial on a weekday and just kind of go through and there's no you know there might be a few kids classes there maybe but like right. you can really have an experience rather than like going to you know a museum in la or whatever it's just like tourists oh. everywhere and just like oh i can't have a moment you know I, I, that's what museums are about is having peace and quiet in front of something well that, and that that's one reason why i love it here i feel like there's my mantra for this year and moving forward i think is uh transitioning from chaos to calm yeah and because my life in i've been back to california three times now already and it's every time it's like oh i don't want to be here i'm so glad we left you know and um, I love the quiet. I love the I love the peacefulness of of Oklahoma. It's, yeah. it's great. I had a previous guest on the podcast, Connor Quinn, a couple of weeks ago, who came from LA as well, and he's like, I love the fact that we don't have traffic. I call the traffic here cute. Yeah. Um, every time I go see my uh, family and more, sometimes there's like a little tiny bit of traffic, but. When the Edmonites, because I'm in Edmond, uh, yeah. the Edmonites complain about traffic, it's just, it's hilarious to me. I'm like, you do not know traffic. In L.A., before I moved, um, my post office, which I went to every day, mm -hmm. was 1.2 miles away. But the 405 freeway was between that. Yeah. It took me 30 minutes to get home every day yeah. from the post office. So, no complaining. It's, it's fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Do you have your stuff in any of the stores in Edmond? There's a AR uh, workshop. Okay. Is um, close to me, and uh, if there's other stationery stores, I need yeah. to know about that. Have you thought about doing? You mentioned the workshop bit. Have you done any teaching and workshopping for your products, like for your skills and stuff? No, 
No, haven't done that yet. Might be an opportunity. Hmm. Teach some people, right? That's fun, actually. Yeah. yeah. And you've been teaching your son for quite a while, so you obviously have to teach a kind of gene in you. But yeah. I, I'm just thinking of like I, I people who do like the paint and sip, right? They have paint classes. Right. And, but I mean. That you could take it two ways. You either do it as, hey, if you want to start a business, like I can teach you how to do this. But also, like if you just want to come hang out and draw silly figures and have puns on, you know, oh, cards that'd be or so whatever, fun. Right? You can actually kind of enjoy it than <laughs> right. like than right. like make it educational. I mean, obviously, it would be educational, but there's a fun kind of sip and draw element to I've it as well. I never thought of that. That would be so fun. Yeah. Wow, but damn, I got to think about that. Definitely. Well, Julie, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in, sharing Thank some you. stories. I'm glad you're here from LA. Glad you love it. Um, glad your son is and seems to be enjoying it too. Yes. Uh, and starting his YouTube channel, being creative. <laughs> uh, like I said, may, you know, there's no telling him. Maybe he will be the next Mr. Beast. Um, but, I mean, crazy. just having the process and, you know, look, learn, being able to learn creatively and grow up the way that he's growing up now. Um, it's pretty special compared to you know the way that we grew up and drawing on pen and paper or pencil right, and paper right. and having to scan <laughs> things in is a little different. Um, finishing up, uh, you're also you're on Instagram at Kiss and Punch and the website as well as Kiss and Kiss and Punch dot com, which I'll put down in the description down below. Um, is there anything you want to leave everybody with, or anything that like either advice or just um, something that you closing you'd want to? leave anybody with so much pressure, so much pressure. Uh, I mean if, if you're someone who's in the corporate world and you have a gift that you need to share then find a way yeah. just find a way don't be scared find a way awesome well again thank you so much for spending uh, some time sharing some stories I uh, wish you all the best for this year and uh, wish you all the best in transitioning from chaos into calm Oh, thank you. <laughs> so thank you for listening and we will catch you next episode. Cheers. Hope you guys enjoyed that great episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. Our other sponsor, the Chickasaw Nation, amazing sponsor they do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in oklahoma they're a huge supporter of oklahoma and without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do and our third sponsor is diffie ford lincoln down in el reno now this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine um play a lot of golf together i've bought my cars from them do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, DiffieFord.net, and then on Instagram at DiffieFordLincoln. This episode is presented by Citizens Bank of Edmund. Citizens Bank of Edmund has been serving Edmund since 1901. They pride themselves on investing in the community and are here for all your personal and business banking needs. For more information, go to MyCitizens.Bank and follow them on Instagram at CitizensEdmund, as well as... Go bank there because I bank there too. It's been a fantastic personal experience for me. I've had my podcast account there now, my podcast business account there now for a few, four years now, I think. And it's been fantastic. So definitely worth your time. They're a great group of people and they're always there to answer the phone when I forget my password because I seem to forget it daily. Uh, so yeah, go to Citizens Edmund and um, check them out. It's been awesome. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.